First, let's do. Let's wait. Okay. Let's do. Let, let's go back in time. So first, let's talk about history, and let's start with 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 your history. So how many of you use Go like before it was even a thing? Yeah. No. That's right. You tried it, and yeah. Really? Okay. Cool. How about uh, like very early days? Here we go. Some people joining. Fifteen more hands, obviously. Seventeen. Yeah, that's that will be like the majority of you, and any newcomers to go. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. All right. So, um, uh, you know, there, there. How many of you actually use modules now? Okay, a couple of hands. Well, I mean, that's fine. That's that's why we're here, right? So uh, don't feel that bad. Okay. So, um. That's me, my name is Baruch, I'm a Chief Speaker Officer at Jeffro, always Head of Developer Relations, but stickers are more fun. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm at Baruch on Twitter, so feel free to follow me uh, after you discover how fun I am, and it will be during today's talk. Uh, conveniently, uh, my Twitter handle is on every slide, so in case you want to follow me, it's right there. Um, disclaimer. That's more of a Silicon Valley, California thing, but I find it useful to mention everywhere. This is a great diagram uh, by Erin Myers, uh, who wrote a great book, it's called Culture Map, and it shows, you know, the culture of different, uh, different countries and different people. So you can see the most emotionally expressive and confrontational people are from Israel and Russia, and I am from both. <laughs> so I, I apologize in advance if I didn't manage to offend you somehow through this talk. That will be on me because I literally supposed to do that. So yeah, no jokes aside, I, I realize that sometimes my uh, the, the way that uh, you know I I communicate might be offending to some people. So if so, I apologize in advance. Right, so this is the most important slide of this talk. Um, you go to jeffro.com slash show notes, you find a page dedicated to this talk today. And the slides are already there. The video that I'm hopefully recording, I did all the right things, uh, I will upload tonight. Uh, the hotel Wi-Fi will allow me, so you will have it by tomorrow. Uh, all the links, including the link for Culture Map book, for example, and also everything we're going to a talk today is, is all there. Place to comment, to rate, and everything. And uh, again, to thank you for coming here. There is a nice raffle there of Amazon Echo Dot. Um, you are not a lot of people, the chances of being are very high. So go there and, and participate. So, with, with that kind of uh, you know housekeeping items aside, let's talk about Go. And in order to understand why we even have a problem, that uh, Go module is, is solving, we need to understand how Go was created. And, and the design began in, in uh, late 2007. First release was what, like 15, uh, 12, 13, so it's a good five, six years. Then what it usually takes for a modern programming language to get from ideation to version two to the first release, and that's fine. And um, key players, you you know, you, you see the familiar uh, names of the Zero Pipe and the Russ Cox and a couple of people that are not doing that anymore, but also some people who are still in the Go business. And uh, now the, the, those are the slides from um, um, from Pike's talk about the history of Go. And I just highlight a couple of moments which I think critical for understanding where modules come and play and why, why they are important. So you can see here, um, where is it? Did it work? There we go. So you see here, like, what, what happened, right? So they had, they built all the Google software with one main file. And, and obviously, uh, the, this main file, 2003, generated from third directory build files, and they had a huge problem with dependencies, which also should be explicit. And and, uh, and and it was it was a very big problem for them back then. 
And they solved a bunch of other problems also, like obviously they weren't happy with the two main languages that were back then in, in, in Google, which is um, C++ and Java, and this is how they came with a different language. But this thing of we build all the software in Google together using one make file was actually uh, was obviously a very very big problem. And uh, they came to uh, they came with, with with a solution, which is a Go language obviously. And the problem of dependencies were solved very elegant. They said, okay, instead of doing it like C C++ does it, when the dependencies are binary files which are statically, uh, sorry, which are dynamically linked, and those binary files, we need to have them in front for every possible um, uh, platform that we might want to use in the future, and it complicates things. Instead, the dependencies will be sources. And then uh, we just import them from version control, and we dump everything together to one source directory, and then we compile everything together, and, and then problem solved, right? I mean, that's exactly how it started, and it makes a lot of sense, and it works until today, especially for organizations like Google, who use the concept of monorepo. We're going to talk about that, right? When everything, all the sources are in one directory, it's very easy to bring more sources of your dependencies to the same directory, and then, and then I do. So this is this is great, and and but there are a couple of things that don't work so great, right? Because there are some questions that are very hard to answer when we work in this scenario, right? So how many of which dependencies do I use? Where is the declaration of my dependency if everything are just sources in one source tree? Or um, how the hell which dependencies did I use? If I go back in time and check out previous code, how many of which dependencies were used then? Or how many of which dependencies should I use? I want now to find an open source library, third party library that I want to use. How do I go about it? I need to check out some arbitrary code from source control into my source control. Where is it? What is it? And, and where do I find it? And basically, how do I know if I edit my own code or a dependency? Now, this is especially a big problem when we have dependencies from different groups inside one organization, right? Because the package statement won't help. They all will be like, I don't know, like org, red hat. But they're, I just use them as a dependency. They're not my code. I'm not supposed to edit it and, and to work on it. And, and generally, What's going on? Right, so when I start adding third party sources to my sources, this is a problem. And the funny thing is, so so here is here is a testimonial from from Dave Cheney. Dave Cheney um, he's a big um, uh, personality in all the all the Go um, ecosystem. He wrote one of the tools that we are going to discuss soon that try to solve this problem. And, and this is his, this is what he was saying. I mean, we use email semaphore to, 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 to work, and, and obviously that was, that was a disaster, right? That cannot be any other way. And, 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 and then this topic was brought up many times with the maintainers of the Go language, with all the Google guys who, who, who wrote Go, uh, in panels, in conferences, in interviews, in podcasts, and, and their answers were, let me say, insufficient. So here's Brad Frit, uh, Frit Pat. Check your dependencies in your own version control. Now, this is wrong, right? You don't want to do that. Or build your own dependency manager. This is Andrew, Jared. Uh, it's on the role of tooling to provide that language to tell how you manage your code in your production. We, we will do it for you. You go ahead and do whatever you like. Or here is another from Andrew. If you need to be tooling around that, around dependency management, use tools that you already use. Do it with Git, Mercurial, and, and you know, get out of back. Just do something. And then here is another one from, from Brett. Well, yes, we provided 
tool like go get, but you really should be really insane to actually use it in production. Right? So don't get me wrong, I have huge respect for those guys. They wrote an amazing language with tons of um, a, a great decisions. Trying to suppress the hard decision of dependencies and pretend that it does not exist didn't help go. Next thing you know, there are 19, and 19 is just not a hypothetical number. There are 19 dependency managers because the community steps in when the, the people who supposed to do it say this is not our problem. The community steps in, and there are 19 dependency managers. So, um, yep, yeah, let's do another quiz. And go devs.json. Which dependency manager this the dependency declaration serves? Yeah. Yes, so not depths, because depths, it's another dependency manager, and for depths, the file is called dependencies.tsv. Okay, out of GoVendor, GoVend, GoVen, and GV, which are two existing tools for dependency manager? All of them, obviously. There are 19, and the names are limited. So obviously all of them. How about trash, garbage, and rubbish? <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Um, no, only one of them. And I think it's trash. <laughs> <laughs> if I remember correctly. Okay. It's a dependency manager from, uh, what's their name, guys? Um, the throat. Uh, oh, I'm. I forget stuff. Um, yeah, I think trash and it stands for. Well, I don't know. One of them is. is, is I don't even know. Uh, no, I don't know. Program Ranger? Huh? Yeah, Program Ranger. Thank you. Oh, yes. Sure. Yeah. And it's trash, right? Yeah. yeah, it's trash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Ranger wrote it. And, uh, okay, we weapons manufacturer? This one is easy. Good luck. For G lock of dependency. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so now you realize that was like absolute, absolutely crazy. What all of them had in common is the concept of vendoring. Right? So, and, and, and vendoring works for them. This is how um, uh, this is how they all work because all of them are based, were based on the idea of how Go worked, and that's the idea of GoPath. That you have a central directory on your computer that all your sources, either yours or all your projects, or third party, your dependencies, actually go there. And GoPath actually is a proud son of monorepo. This concept of, of a Go, that they promote very actively, there are it's just an example of how, if you search YouTube for Monorepo, you will find thousands of talks of Google, but not also, but also other companies that work with, or organizations that work in this concept of Monorepo and how wonderful it works for them. And I have nothing against Monorepo, it's just not the only right way to do things. But GoPath promotes it very strongly, and this is why vendoring and that's adding our sources to those sources actually makes sense. But there are two problems with GoPath. The first, it only allows single version of any given package existed once, whatever is in your GoPath. And also, we cannot programmatically differentiate between the code that the user is working and the code they merely depend. Not only programmatically, sometimes we cannot even humanly the distinct between them, for example, if there are dependencies from different teams, the example that I gave, if we are in the same organization, there is no way for us to know if it's our code or not. And you know what? Between you and me, six months ahead, you won't recognize even your own code, right? So, uh, and programmatically, obviously, there is no difference. So, um, and, and, and vendoring is, vendoring is really bad. Because vendoring is the worst kind of port. What you do is you find a version of third party code, you copy their sources to your version control repository. This is what you do, you, you perform fork. 
right? You take someone else's code that is a certain amount of time and you create the fork in your in your source control. And, and well, everything is wrong about it. Uh, you lose history branch and tag, obviously, when you create a copy. Um, uh, it's impossible to pull updates because they are completely disconnected from them now. It's not like you really have, um, you know, a, a fork in which you can sync. It's like you took that, you went away, and whatever happens there, you don't know anymore. Um, obviously, it, it invites modification and divergence because you start fixing bugs in whatever your version of their code you took, and they obviously do the same and run forward, so you diverge without any good reason. It wastes space, that's the least of our problems. Um, and obviously the biggest problem is you have no idea which version of the code you took. You don't know. Right? And, and, and here there is a solution for that, and I don't know if any of this group uh, knows how partially solve it. Anyone have want to shout? Yeah. Get some modules. Thank you very much. That's I didn't pay you. And, and yeah, you can say we use some modules. And uh, I love that you are laughing because you know what's coming. Yeah. yeah. Awful. It's horrible. Because you still have no idea what version you're using. You have to connect each and every dependency as a sub-module. And switching in branches and forking and obviously working on modules with other teams. That's all, that's all just nightmare. So it solves some problems, but, but. So, so here we are, right? Here we are. Uh, it's been almost a decade uh, when, when, we, when, when Google decided to real tackle this problem. There is a huge ecosystem of tools that all of them do the best they can, but it's still bad because of how Go works with dependencies. And, and here Google, are, or the community, are to a quest to find a better solution. And, and the first, um, the first uh, attempt to find a, a good solution was what is known as the Go Dev Expert. Now, um, Sam Boer, he's amazing. And he's a, he's, a big, he's a big shot in, in the Ruby community, and he volunteered to help go to, 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 to write a, a better dependency manager. <laughs> so, yeah, you want to write a better manager, and you woke up this morning, roll out of bed, and thought, you know what, I will have my misery and suffering in my life. I know what I will do. I will write a language package manager. And then he tried, and then he comes to the following conclusions. Software is terrible, people are terrible, there are too many different scenarios, nothing will really work for sure. It's provable mathematically that nothing will really work for sure. Our lives is in the perturbations, dirty forest, hours, and entropy, which is very true. And, and I have to say that we are in JFrog, we do, we work with dependency managers, we do uh, repositories for those dependency managers. I mean, we probably suffer a fraction of what Sam went through, but we can relate. Dependency management is a horrible domain to be in. Interesting though, challenging. Right, so, and, and, and the dev experiment was a success because um, there is no idea of GoPath anymore. We work in project directories. We use local cache for dependencies. Dependencies are artifacts which are managed and versioned properly, right? There are atomic units in some point of time with version and metadata and what's not. And uh, you have version declarations uh, that work with Semver, and you can uh, rely on those version declarations to lock them, to exclude them, to replace them. It's like, wow, it's, it's a proper dependency management, right? Which is, which is, which is cool. Uh, conflict resolution, and uh, talking about conflicts, there was a conflict. And, and you can Google for it, I think, uh, uh, you don't need to Google for it, you just go to jeff.com and show notes, and you will see a couple of links there about these conflicts going on uh, between Sam Boyer and, and, uh, um, and Russ Cox about 
Boolean satisfiability problem, about satisfiability model of theories, about minimalistic version selection, and semantic input versioning. Uh, those are uh, the acronyms that are there. Um, it's part human drama and part you know, computer science discussion. Both parts are obviously fascinating, and you're more than invited to read. Long story short, where in the modules there are no yeah, where in the modules there is no uh, go dev anymore, and um, let's talk about them. So now you have all the background, you know, all the juicy details, and now let's talk about them. So first of all, after ten years of community working on this, most of us probably have some type of solution that we depend on. Dev, devs, whatever, trash, block, whatever, we already use something. And now how the migration works? And we kind of, oh, we don't know, it will be hard to migrate, to, to migrate. And then you run go mode in it, and then they create a go mode file, and then it just works. Nothing changes. You keep doing your imports on your in your code, and everything just works out of the box. And this is pretty impressive because, as, as, as I mentioned, there is like, the market is absolutely crazy and, and, and being able to do this migration and backwards compatibility in the way that majority of us won't even know that, we, that something changed, that's very, very cool. And the, the, the way that it works is that there are converters created for at least, I think, like nine of the most popular dependency managers that know how to take the information from all those descriptors and parse them into Go modules. So you don't actually have to do anything. So now I said you create a Go module, you do the init. If you never work with model, it will be empty. If it's a new project, it will be empty. Uh, or it will be migrated, and then you add an import in your in your source file. You added an import and you run go get or go build. What happens next? So what's happening is I have no idea why the flow is from right to left, but it was too too late to change. So um, the first thing that happens is the go will try to access the import as a URL because it is a URL, and if on the other side is a version control, which will happen in the majority of the cases because most of them go to GitHub. Then we can clone the sources to the local machine, build the module locally as an as a um, like as a, as, a, as a discrete dependency as a module, and then serve the module to the compiler to compile with our sources. Now, if it's not a version control, it might be a web, web page. There are some dependencies that go to, what's this resource? Uh, Young Docs? Go back on them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and then it's not a version control. But then, um, it might have a go import a tag. Tag, tag, yeah, meta tag. Go import meta tag. If there is a go import meta tag, then we can follow the import URL and do the same resolution again. If it's not, I don't know, something is wrong in this diagram. But if it, if it doesn't have the go, uh, the go import, then it's just an invalid import class and it will it, and it won't compile. Right? So this is this is how it works. This is how the magic works. And the, the, basically the only part that is different from what is happening today is the part that the sources will be cloned outside of our working directory. I'm sure you two go path that we don't use anymore, but it will be a cache for our modules, and the module there will be created, and then it will be used. So this is how it works, and, and the only the, the last question is kind of trivial. Okay, so now when modules are versioned, how we select a version because when we write an import, we don't specify which, which version because we, we are not importing a dependency. 
we are importing um, um, a Go file, right? We, 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 are, uh, we are importing something that kind of that our dependence kind of the source. So it doesn't have a version declaration in the import. So how the versions are selected? And the answer is latest compatible version text. Can you go like, um, what does it mean? How do we know that the version tag is actually compatible? And this is where the, the I think the, the essence of um, the discussion between, or this conflict be, between Russ and, 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 and Sam had. Because what Russ said is, Let's assume that same works. <laughs> Let's assume that if I take the latest major, the latest version in the major version range, it will be compatible with everything in the same version, major version. Which is obviously a very silly assumption, and, and, and everybody knows. All this including Russ. He's brilliant. He knows that that's, that, that is not true. But he said, let's the community figure it out. I think we already have been there in this scenario, but okay. Let the community figure it out. And if the latest version is not compatible, let them complain to the maintainers of this of this library to release a version which is compatible. Right? And and uh, so the latest version of 1.xs is compatible with 1.00 and everything in between. Right? That's the assumption. And and then uh, and then everything works actually. Then you don't need to specify the version anywhere because input pass string relates to a single major version. When you say I want to import my user slash my repo slash my go file, what you actually mean is grab the latest go file from the version 1.xx. Right? And then the question is okay, uh, we, we, take, we take the latest one in the 1.0 range, 1. whatever range. How about version 2? How do we migrate version 2? Well, that's very easy. Incompatible code cannot be used in the same input file. And that means that we need to add slash v2 in our module pass and use it in our input file. And then it becomes completely different module. Problem solved. Because now everything in this module with version 2 in the path will be compatible in v2 range and there is no problem. Which is elegant and simple, but also, you know, we rely completely on, on, on center. Right, so you will go and you will import something like my, my module v2 my package. Okay, so now without v2 everything will work because it's version 1. With v2 everything will work because it's version 2. It's a completely different path, so there is no problem. Right, now couple of issues that we need to tackle right in front. First of all, what if my package is not version? First of all, where is version is, is declared at all? Version is declared in git tags. I create a git tag with the proper naming which colorates to the same version, and this is how Go will know how to resolve, how to search for a version. But what if I didn't do any tag? Right? The import should work. There is no requirement for me to import only modules that or, or packages that have tags. Then we will do what is called a pseudo version. Pseudo version will be a version under the latest release. So if I don't have any tags, the version will be 0, 0, 0 because I didn't declare I'm ready for, for 1.0. So don't judge me now, but your Samware backwards compatibility rules. I didn't take any responsibility, I didn't create a tag, so it will be version 000, and then we'll have some uh, timestamp and hash code of, of my commit. But, and then all, all guarantees are off, 
there is no compatibility at all in any range because I didn't commit to any versions or compatibilities. And every commit will be by itself and will never be chosen one above it if this commit was used. And, and obviously the biggest question is, okay, we all know that Semper doesn't work. Well, it works in theory, but it relies on people. It doesn't work. Um, so, so what happens if, if, if someone releases a new tag, a new version, which is not compatible by the rules of Semper? Then you can actually, then you need to do some work. You need to finally open your Go mod file that before that you didn't even look at. You knew it existed, but you never cared what's in it. And manually specify versions. Right? You will see in your Go mod file, you will see a list of the modules used with the versions that uh, Go uh, resolution engine will find for you. That will be the, the, the latest versions. And then you need to override and say version X or later, because something before that won't work. Or you can also do exclude or replace. Now replace works with local path. So you can say, I patched this version manually, and now I have a patch that I for sure don't want to publish everywhere because I don't want to create a fork, but I have a patch on my local machine or in my CI server where my build happens. So until they release a version, you can use that. And I guess the veterans among us can feel where it's going and how horrible will it be if we ever use local replace? Because this is how works on my machine happens, obviously. So don't do that. But you can. Okay, so this is this is the idea. This is how it works. And and, and you can understand that we've been here for uh, what, like uh, less than an hour, and the majority of time I took you through history and what's not, and actually speaking about modules took like 15 minutes, and you are up to speed, you know what's going on. And and, and that's great, that's, that's a sign of great design, which is simple and easy to grasp, backwards compatible, but let's talk about a different aspect. And a different aspect might be, okay, now we're doing Everything was on our control. Yes, we did this ugly fork, but eventually our version of dependency they relied on us. Now we rely on someone else's code in the internet. What can possibly go wrong? Right? And a lot of things can go wrong. For example, by in theory, all the all the modules should be immutable. The module and version construct should be immutable, and that means that this thing should forever produce the same results. When I try to resolve this, it will always have to uh, give me the same results. And how do we guarantee it? Git tax? Not really. <clears throat> uh, because, you know, push minus F does exactly that. And then we are in much worse scenario than we were when we did vendoring. This is why people say, leave me to my vendoring, I don't trust this crap. And, and, and they have a point, because if I run the same build, half a year from now, and it produces different results, that's a disaster. So I would prefer to do this lousy clone and have my own copy of all my dependencies, but then at least I can be sure that I have a repeatable thing. But obviously with modules there is a better way. And there is a better way by introducing a proxy or a repository, how it should really be called for your uh, for for your for your module, and then you do export your proxy to some location, and then you just run the normal commands. And what this proxy will do 
it will actually proxy right the third party modules that you are dependent. So now the same diagram we add import to the URL and then the first check will be do we have a proxy set? If we have a proxy set, then let's just sort the module from there. Problem solved. And if we can guarantee that this modular repo is immutable, then we solve the problem. Once it's fetched once from the remote repository, we're all good. Now, the rest is, is, is the same, right? So, now we have this uh, extra level of redundancy that's all. So we need to keep the modules, and there are three different levels in which the modules are kept. And that might be familiar for people who come from different languages to go, even you know, from if you have the Java background, or if uh, um, Ruby, NPM, and, and this is the same concept that we have in our language. So first we have a local cache. Our go path now serves as an internal cache for our modules, and they will be saved right there. And uh, obviously the benefits are that it has immediate access, super fast, it's a real world machine, but they are not shared with the rest of the developer that's stayed on my machine, and they can be easily vibed because, you know, I write my machine or, or anything. The next level, is organizational level cache, which is a private proxy, private repository. It provides fast access, so it's still in our LAN, right? Um, and it requires infrastructure. You can have it as a service, or you need to set up your own machine, or whatever, but there is some effort in it. But it's shared across the developers in our organization. And obviously, the benefit of it is that now we have reproducible builds for everybody and everybody use the same modules. Another benefit is that we can share their modules that we create for other teams, which are not open source and shouldn't go on GitHub or whatever. So we can share them as modules already in our organization cache. So there, there are a number of projects, obviously. I'm here because Jeffrey is paying me to mention Jeff over the factory. And completely unbiased, I can promise you that that's the best one you can find. Uh, uh, t-shirts, by the way, that will be a good point to pick out t-shirts, right? I have a, a bunch of t-shirts over there, so don't forget to pick up uh, some t-shirts on your way out. Now, when you're convinced that Jeffrey Factor is the best option, I'll manage another one, which is also great. Um, it's called Project Athens. Um, it's uh, run by a community, the project lead is from Microsoft. Uh, the, uh, the guy that I already quoted, Aaron Schmesinger, um, it's open source, you run it, it only does Go modules and no one, nothing else. Well, well, Artifactory does like any binary that you have in your organization probably is important. Uh, so this is your organizational uh, level of caching. And then there is a public cache, public repository, public proxy, call it whatever you like. And, and those are highly available. Those run on CDN infrastructure and they don't cost any money. Um, obviously, Jeffrey Globe Center is, is one of them, and the other is a proxy from, from Google. Right? There is no right one or wrong one. Obviously, Google has creators of Go, um, even they don't position there as the single source of truth. But, uh, Russ spoke about the duration of proxy of mirrors, uh, uh, and we're going to talk about a little bit why GoCenter might be the destination for you, but in any way here, you can definitely pick the one that you feel right. So basically, if you have all three of them set up, you will point your Go proxy variable to your organizational cache, and it will know how to proxy the global repository when they need um, when they need the modules that they don't have. And this global will know how to fetch from sources if the module wasn't created. But once this is done, we will have an immutable module here, 
an individual module here, and kind of disposable module, but still will provide you with faster access on your local machine. So this is kind of the hierarchies of what we right? So renewable and repeatable, and, and repeatable builds, immutable dependencies, best way to guarantee the issues of, of force push, close dependencies, left fund, someone just said, fuck it all, I take all my dependencies offline and good luck building, right? And and uh, internet issues, right? You have download or whatever. If you have local or factory, that uh, helps. If GitHub down but goes and goes up, that helps. If goes and goes down, never happen through our entire nine months of resistance, yay. Um, then you can go to other repositories and use them as well. Right? Also, password builds. You have those caches, you never have to wait for git clone, build module in my machine, and then make it available. And this is actually a big deal. Um, we see a 10, it, it depends on a lot of stuff, but, but if I need to throw a number how fast uh, we, we, it's built with goal center and without goal center, I will say something between three times to 10 times faster for like a normal project that has a reasonable number of dependencies. Obviously, it depends on the project and stuff. But you can, you, can, you can understand where the settings are. Instead of git clone, pack, put it in cache, you just go and do an HTTP uh, get. Obviously, much faster. Right? So, um, where is my mouse? Uh, ah, yeah, yeah. No, we, we spoke about all that, so I'm gonna skip. Um, no, oh, never mind. Right. Um, yeah. So, um, this is something that I wanted to show with you and kind of get your your input maybe on it. Because, uh, so now the official part is over. So thank you very much. Now you know everything you, okay, you need to know about your modules and, and uh, hopefully you're not afraid to start giving them a try tomorrow. And, and now I wanted to use like a less formal bit format to discuss with you uh, how can we make Go Center more useful for you. Right, so we spoke about you work with your own code, you write your own Go code and you do imports. You barely look at uh, at your Go mod file. Only if you need to fix some versions or to nail down some versions or do something like that. You obviously you know, even less frequently look at any of the of the proxies just because they just work, right? And and obviously when you have something that you never look at from JetRock and something that you never look at from the official creators of Go language, I'm not sure how good our odds are. So what I want to ask you is, what will make you, Go developers, actually go and look and find more value and then actually make it more useful for you? So the stuff that we started working on is you go to gocenter.io and you can search for a package. And when you find a package or a module, you can see the documentation right here and there and check if it does the job that you need. Statistics. Is it a popular package? Is it a popular model? How, how many other projects depend on this module? How many downloads happened at from those and those modules? Um, not just so, for example, you are dependent on some module and you realize that they never released an official tag. That you work with those seven modules which give you zero conference resolution. Because, as we mentioned, pseudo versions are not backwards or forward compatible. If you have a diamond problem, project A depends on module A, depends on module B and on module C, and they depend on different versions of D, Sandbird solves it, but only 
if we have compatible tags. If we have self version, there is no conflict resolution and it will block. Now, what we want to do is you will be able to open an issue or to upload an issue of creating a proper version for a module that you want to use, but not being able to uh, rely on a tag makes it different for you. And, and the one that I personally am super excited about, just because Russian, Israeli, judgmental, I don't give a shit, are rankings. And people in the Silicon Valley are very sensitive. If we are going to give a bad rating for the project, we are going to offend the author. And I'm like, fuck him, let him fix his shit, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's that's a delicate, that's a delicate, uh, delicate problem because who the judges are. And and I think that what I wanted to hear from you, and you know, you know, you load, you know, you make noises now of what actually makes sense and what, what's not. So I, we want to come with a formula to include the following, uh, the following factors into, into, into an equation, right? So documentation. Is a project well documented? Obviously, if there is no documentation, that's losing points. Active development. We can see where were the last commits. And if they are, if there is not development, that's actually losing points. Number of stars. This one is, I don't like it because it's kind of a vanity, vanity factor, right? That's how much the, the creator is a celebrity or what's not. On the other side, stars now are a common currency for expressing your love and appreciation for a project. So maybe just not very high on those, on, on this list. Unit as coverage. Now this one, people people say they don't really care much. So what do you say? Is it important, not important? Kind of, uh, as long as it works, we don't care. But, if there is a but, how easy it will be for them to fix it if they don't have good wing coverage. Uh, licensing, obviously very important. If the license is permissive enough, for us to use, but not viral for us to put our, uh, our project in jeopardy. So there are licenses which are considered comfortable and those who are, which are less. And, and another one is number of dependencies. That's an interesting one. So it's usually, but we, we use dependencies like at will. We find something that gives us a solution for a problem, Google will have an independence. Especially again, if you come from the world of JavaScript, those guys have a dependency for every three lines of JavaScript code. It will be a dependency. Um, and Java also, like we don't we don't care. Uh, but if you are if you are developing a library that you expect other people to depend on. This is where you need to minimize the number of dependencies that you use. Because every dependency that you add, you actually add complexity, and it's a source for potential transitive dependencies conflict, right? And you bring other people's code to your user's runtime, not to yours. Uh, yeah, massive unit tests, that's kind of obvious. If you already have unit tests, you better pass them. Number of forks. Number of forks is kind of in the same with number of stars. That's how popular this project is. Probably not critical, but it's nice if it's a popular project with a lot of forks. Number of maintainers, that's the, the bus factor, right? If there is a single maintainer that gains up on a project that you are dependent on, there will be no bug fixes. No future versions. That's a very big jeopardy for for your project. Right. So number of number of maintenance is important. Um, and the transitive score of the dependencies. If you already have dependencies, that better be good by those methods. And and here is uh, there's something else, right? Yeah, security. Um, so one of the things that we do with Jeffrod 
have GeoFrog X-Ray, which is a security and license compliance a tool. And, and what we actually think is plugging it to, to, to Go Center as well. So you will see if there are any security issues and obviously it will harm the score if, if they are. It's kind of a big deal as well. And the last is number, not the last by importance, but last of this list, number of downloads as well. Right, so if it's popular, you can do one time. Now, what, what, I, what I want to do, what we want to do eventually is you will have a dependency page in GoSender that you search <coughs> and you find and you see uh, you see um, a rating, A minus, and you will see why, what are the factors that are not ideal, right? Maybe they have um, not, not like very high unit test coverage, but everything else is great, and you will be able to decide if it's good or not. Or even more fun, how about when you search, you can filter those who are below C. Same bill. Don't even show me bills. If I look now for an HTTP client library, I don't want to see the garbage. Well, probably I won't be. I won't let Go Center to select automatically for me between one with A and one with B. I will want to look at both of them and understand why we gave B to another one. But probably D with you know, with non permissive license and, and, and security vulnerabilities and all kind of all kind of garbage I don't want to see in my in my search. Right, so this is this is the where, where we are going with that. And and the idea for us is that going to go center the dial will give you some added value on top of the basic functionality that every Go policy does. And that, I will be more than happy to discuss this part because this is something that is very exciting. We are doing it now, and we want to want to hear what you're saying. Some part of it is already in goes under the dial, so you can see the documentation and some of those stats without giving the breaks now, just explaining them so people can see, it, and, and that will be the next step. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Jeffro.com says show notes, this is where you go for, for, for everything. I am Jay Bauer from Twitter, now you for sure know that you need to follow me. And I have no idea if this uh, meetup had a hashtag before today. Now it does. So when you praise this talk on Twitter, use the triangle go line um, hashtag. And also go send the dial. Take a look what's there now. You know what's coming next. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be right back. Thank you. Is there a way to do uh, like a match report of all your dependencies? Is that if I go to Go Center, I might not necessarily want to look at them the help one by one, I might want to see that. Yeah, there is there is so your dependencies you don't you don't search in those. Your dependencies are on your machine and the full descriptor of your dependencies is the GoMod file. It has all the dependencies. Now, more so, when you build, Go by itself adds all the transitive dependencies explicitly to your Go mode, which is awesome. Especially anyone, Maven, anyone? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Maven transitive dependencies yeah. resolution, oh. Joyce, right? So now, no problem in Go. Everything that is a result explicitly added to go mode file so every time you open it boom all your fences are like that awesome are the artifacts just sources yes the artifacts are, are archives of sources okay. yes because this is how go works yeah. right you depend on sources and and the, the, the easiest way to create dependable artifacts is just archive is the same with npm uh, it's the same with Python, with Ruby, with every like everything that is not com 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 compilable, whatever the word is. <laughs> uh, it's not so with C++ or so with Conan, for example, or with Java, but there are tons of examples where it's just archives of sources and it works well.
any kind of code analysis now? Like one thing that we have to do is this, um, uh, export control for like cryptography, for example. Yeah. So, you know, there's certain <laughs> so this is not a part of dependency management at all, and you use your static code analysis as you used to do that. What we can now do on top of that is actually analyze the artifacts, right? Analyze the, the modules themselves. And this is, for example, what uh, Jeffrey X-Ray does, right? So it's a, it's a security analysis tool, but we don't look for patterns like dependency injection in the source code, like other tools do. Instead, we know the identifier of this, um, of this module, and we can compare with security databases to see if a non vulnerability was declared against this module. You can only do that if you have a module as a discrete unit which is identified by a name plus version, and, and then you can go and compare it through the databases. So now we can finally do that for, for Go as well. Yep. So, uh, I have a transitive dependency. Yep. Uh, a, I'm working on an issue on A. It depends on the library in B. Uh -huh. And the fit, the work that I'm working on, uh, touch, touches B as well. Yes. So, I fork B. Uh, I, I fork B. I create a pull request there. Okay. Do I have to wait for that pull request to get in to start working on A again? How, how does that scenario work in case of one? So, you will build your own version of B. And now you need to decide what you want to do with it. So, you can say, okay, I want to keep it on my machine, and I will use the direct, the replace directive to work with my version of B for, for now. Uh, and that's not the best solution, obviously, because now your machine state is different from my machine. What we can already do is we can publish it to our organizational repository. We can put it in Jeffrey Art Factory, we can put it in Project Assets. If we version it differently, so everybody knows that it's a patch that shouldn't be relied on because when it will be merged, another version, another tag of the official of the official report of the official dependency will be published, we can use that for a while. But we need to be very careful to replace it back once the tag is published. But yes, an organizational repository gives you the ability to share those artifacts which are not public, not final, and all this kind of stuff. This is where you need Jeffrey Factor or Project Affects. That's exactly that. Yes. Does that require a manual edit? Yes, obviously, if you want to use a version which is an out of your normal SEMVER operation, which is take the highest inside a major version, you specify a version in your Go mod file. That's exactly why it is there. Now, it's very easy because it's just a list of declarations of your modules with their centers. That is why. It's very easy to do. You don't need to bring another tool for that. It's all there. It's like very good. And another cool thing is, and and that I just recall how cool Go is in this aspect is, if you try to add a module in your Go module file, but you never use it in code, it will feel fairly good, which is which is cool because the way that you should go is. You actually write code. You don't care about which dependencies it translates to. If you have a problem, you obviously can go and fix and replace and, and nail down the version or do whatever you like. But your normal mode of operation, don't think about it. Just write your code, which is which is super cool. So uh, at Go for Con, they talked about project apps. Yes. They had talked about how the proxy was able to be intelligent about what it transferred. Um, in the sense that I guess there could be a much larger amount of data that has to be retrieved to do dependency, resolution, and management. If 
you're just going directly to the sources and get yeah. the data versus going to the proxy, the proxy is able to just send you what you need. Is that true? That's going to be true for um, Go Center. Well. That's true for Go Center. That's true for Jeffrey Blackwood. That's true for all of them. They are all um, lazy proxy that will only retrieve what's needed, and the dependencies that are pre previously cached, they will be obviously served from the repository itself and won't need to be cloned and rebuilt every time as it was if you go directly to the account. Yeah. Now another thing we just talked about too is the, uh, the notary. Yeah, so if I'm not in the app, okay, so the idea of notary was there will be a, so this, Notary is a part of a bigger vision of how those public repositories or proxies or mirrors, whatever they call, coexist. And um, the idea was, okay, every module can exist in those repositories by their name of the name and the burden. But how do we know which one is true if suddenly what we have in Job Center is different by checksum from what it is in Google repository? Who is right? And the idea of notary was to have another set of independent servers which will have a list of which checksums are correct. And they will be different from the servers of repositories, so we want to have the, the cat that looks over the crib, right? So we will have like, because obviously we will make sure that if we both have the notary and the repository that they always match. And, and it's a challenge because again, who do you trust? We spoke a lot with Russ about it as we were, when he came with this idea, well, so no person was there first, because before there was like a Google repository. And then uh, Google and Russ, they were like, okay, we want to do a repository as well. But who is, who has the golden image? Who has the golden, the right, the right, uh, the right module? Should we proxy one, one each other? We don't want to proxy one each other. Uh, can we rely on when we build, when we run go build, it will produce a file that will forever provide the same checksum? No, because you know what? We use GZ, the algorithm of GZ can, can change over versions and we will have different, different checksums, right? We can, I mean, we can decide how we, um, the format of the go mod file can change. If we add another space in the header, it will fuck up the entire, the entire checksums of everything. So how can we realize which checksum of the same module is correct? If, if we are different organizations that run two different sets of modules. And the notary was one of them, and um, uh, what our idea was, and I think that notary is not finalized, there are no notaries, and, and uh, we don't know if there ever be because of this complexity of deciding who is right. And what we suggested, and, and I frankly don't know, I'm personally not a part of this conversation, um, what we suggested is whoever builds first has the correct checks. Right? So if uh, this module appeared first in Google repository, but we also have it with different uh, checksum, our is the wrong one. Because remember immutability, once we build it, it should always be the same. This is the correct one. The other way around. If it was, if this module was created first under a certain version and it appeared in Go Center, that's the right one. And if the if the checksum does match, that's a problem on the other side. So I think it's still debate, debatable unless 
at least some announcement about it in in, in, uh, in BlockerCon, but I think it was like, well, we have this idea, we're not sure how to go about it. What was it about that? Uh, uh, it, was, it was talked about. But yeah, no, I mean, it was talked about from November last year, but it's still not, there is no not a way out there. I was just curious about it. Yeah. No, this, this is a serious problem, and, and I don't think there is a simple solution for that. And I think we kind of now, as a community, try to find our way what will be the correct one. From one side, protecting the community and guaranteeing the immutable dependencies, and from the other side, not getting a, not letting one company to take a leverage to be the golden standard, because obviously no one will ever use anything else. And that's not it. So yeah, I think that's kind of where where it stands. Makes sense?